Remind all members and officials, please, if you can, turn your cell phones off or please, or place them on silent or vibrate. And to indicate to everyone that this hearing is being broadcast live on Parliament Channel 11, Parliament Radio 105.5 FM, and the Parliament's YouTube channel, Palview. And to invite the listening audience that you can send your comments via email to pal101 at ttparliament.org on our Facebook. I'd like to welcome officials of the Ministry of Public Utilities and the Water and Sewage Authority, and we will seek your introduction a bit later on. Um, I would like to introduce myself. My name is uh, Derup Timal, and I'm chairman of this Joint Select Committee. Uh, I'd like to invite our members of the committee to introduce themselves. Yes, good evening. My name is Wade Mark, member. Good afternoon, all. I am Glenda Jennings Smith, and I'm a member of this committee. Good afternoon, everyone. Nigel Lefritas, member. Okay, thank you, members. I would like to inform all representatives here from the respective entities of the objectives of this particular inquiry. We have three key objectives. The first one being to examine the current strategies for ensuring water security and the effectiveness of these strategies. Two, to determine the measures required for improving water security. And third, objective to determine the challenges with ensuring water security in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I'd like to, at this uh, point, I'd like to invite um, the officials who are here to introduce themselves, following which I would uh, ask for opening remarks to be made by one representative each from respectively from the Ministry of Public Utilities and WASA. So please. Good afternoon, Chair Members. I am Nicolette Duke, Acting Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Public Utilities. Good afternoon to members of the committee. I am Beverly Khan, the Deputy PS of the Ministry of Public Utilities. Good afternoon. I'm Rajendra Gosain, Head, Water Resources Agency, Water and Surge Authority. Good afternoon. My name is Sherry dumas Herwood, Director, Customer Care, Water and Surge Authority. Good afternoon. Alan Poonking, Acting Chief Executive Officer, WASA. Good afternoon. Sheldon Shepard, Director of Operations, Water and Surge Authority. Good afternoon, Denise Lising Pereira, Director, Programs and Change, Water and Sewage Authority. Good afternoon, Sarah Jade Govaya, Water Sector Specialist, Ministry of Public Utilities. Good afternoon, members. Kenneth Kerr, Acting Chief Climatologist, Meteorological Services Division, Ministry of Public Utilities. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, at this stage, we would. Uh, we would open with uh, questioning from, uh, oh, before we go to the opening remarks, please, from uh, both uh, WASA and Public Utilities. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for this opportunity to the committee to share the Ministry of Public Utilities role as it relates to water security in Trinidad and Tobago. The subject of water security spans several agencies. However, under the remit of the Ministry, the Water and Sewage Authority and the Meteorological Services Division are the major players. WASA providing the water supply to the citizenry and the Met Services Division monitoring the weather and climate that is linked to the water supply in our country. The Ministry of Public Utilities as part of its governing and oversight mandate of these agencies has developed a number of policies and high level strategies for the short, medium and long term 
that are aligned to Vision 2030 and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals to set the strategic direction for water-related agencies. These strategic priorities include, but are not limited to, providing safe and reliable public utility services to meet the needs of households, communities, and businesses, expanding accessibility to public utility services to, currently to the currently unserved and underserved areas, streamlining the operations of the public utilities to increase efficiency, productivity, and financial viability, and promoting conservation and sustainable consumption. WASA's implementation in respect of these priorities is intended to assist the authority in providing water supply that is of an adequate quality and quantity to sustain the population of Trinidad and Tobago, as well as to ensure the sustainable use, conservation, and protection of water resources. To assist the ministry in its oversight, performance indicators were also developed to benchmark WASA against regional and international utilities, as well as against its own progress. These indicators are aligned to the ministry's priority areas and include development of a customer-centric culture, operational efficiency, financial viability, organization redesign, and governance. The ministry acknowledges that WASA has some overarching water supply management issues to address, and as such has been working with the Inter-American Development Bank to develop a water sector improvement program. In order to achieve the objectives of this program, the following imperatives are to be undertaken. Implementation of metering throughout the population, network optimization to replace strategic high leakage mains and service connection and the bottling of the network, climate change investments to increase storage, mitigate flooding, and localize production, and establishment of a performance-based culture in WASA. Members, the ministry embraces its role as an advocate of the national vision, which fundamentally seeks the improvement of the quality of life of all its citizens. And therefore, emphasis is placed on the provision of efficient, cost-effective, and reliable public utility services throughout Trinidad and Tobago. The ministry will continue to provide strategic guidance, support, and facilitate WASA in delivering on its in initiatives so that the authority can continue to contribute to Trinidad and Tobago's socioeconomic development. The ministry therefore looks forward to the recommendations of the committee and as well as its other stakeholders in moving this thrust forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Ponking, you're going for WASA. Okay, good afternoon, Chairman and members of the Joint Select Committee, and thank you for having WASA here um, to provide uh, information on our contribution towards the establishment of water security for citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. In 2013, UN Water provided a working definition of water security as the capacity of a population to safeguard sustainable access to adequate quantities of acceptable quality water for sustaining livelihoods, human well-being, and socio-economic development, for ensuring protection against waterborne pollution and water-related disasters, and for, pre pre and for preserving ecosystems in a climate of peace and political stability. This de definition is quite broad in its context. However, it is clear that it requires a multi-pronged, multi-dimensional approach in order to successfully achieve its goal including the adoption of an integrated water resources management approach to dealing with this precious resource. IWRM explicitly challenges conventional fragmented water development and management systems and places emphasis on an integrated approach with more coordinated decision making across sectors. This integrated approach to water management is a process that seeks to attain three main strategic objectives efficiency, equity, and environmental sustainability. 
The process recognizes that exclusively top-down, supply-oriented, technical, technically based and sectoral approaches to water management are imposing unsustainable high economic cost on society. WAS is mandated to provide water and wastewater services to the population of Trinidad and Tobago. This means that the authority has a major role to play in the IWRM process and ultimately plans towards achieving water security. It is important to note that in order to provide water services to our citizens, the authority must undertake several key activities associated with developing and maintaining water treatment sources, as well as transmission and distribution systems. In this regard, the authority continues to develop new water sources, maintain existing ones, and treat these raw water sources to meet international drinking water standards. Towards this end, some of the infrastructure development projects completed by the authority include construction of intakes and wells. In order to effectively deliver and sustain our water supply to our citizens, the authority must also place fo focus on its pipeline transmission and distribution network, which has been enhanced through the construction of new service reservoirs across the country and booster stations in North and South and Central Trinidad. Authority has also laid critical pipelines to provide connectivity to previously underserved areas in Trinidad and Tobago and place great emphasis on leak repair, the, its leak repair program in order to reduce its level of unaccounted for water while improving the level of service to customers. Another key area of the authority's operations that requires equal attention regarding infrastructural development and maintenance is the area of wastewater collection and treatment, since this can have a major impact on public health and the environment. To this end, the new Malabar Wastewater Treatment Plan and Collection System has been completed with funding secured through the Inter-American Development Bank. Through this program, approximately 30,000 residents are benefiting from the construction of the facility and this is expected to increase to over 108,000 upon completion of all phases on the collection system to serve the full Malabar catchment. In Tobago, there has also been a significant improvement in wastewater services with the construction of two new sewer systems at Bonacord and Salmon Grove. This has resulted in over 400 new wastewater customers and the environment an, an, an improvement in the wastewater coverage to customers in the coastal areas of Crown Point, Pigeon Point, Black Rock, Golden Grove, and Buco. As the Water Resources Agency leads the IWRM efforts, we must all work to minimize the negative effects of activities that pose significant threats to our water courses, which ultimately impact water availability, quality, and flooding. These include indiscriminate wastage, indiscriminate dumping, sedimentation of streams through poorly managed quarrying, disposal of industrial effluent, discharge from non-functioning wastewater treatment plants, slash and burn agricultural practices, and agricultural runoff. In addition to these anthropogenic activities, there are also natural threats to our water resources from the impacts of climate variability and climate change. This is evident by the reduced rainfall locally in recent years and the harsh 2019 dry and wet seasons in particular. These threats to the quantity and quality of our water resources are also occurring against a backdrop, backdrop of increasing demand for potable water. Although the resource is renewable, it is finite and must therefore be managed sustainably. As a country, we urgently need to achieve a paradigm shift in the way we treat with our water resources. The narrative of Trinidad and Tobago being classified as water rich must be tempered by the reality that without efficient water resource management, we will not avoid the fate of other water stress nations. This speaks directly to the ability of all sectors and stakeholders working collaboratively to achieve water sustainability for our nation. But the authority remains committed to doing its part towards this end I will continue to work closely with other stakeholders to ensure that we remain on a path to, to achieving this goal. I thank you. Okay, so um, we'll now have some questions being posed by members. And um, 
I think we just just as a reminder to, to, to bear in, to bear in mind that um, I'm sure Wasa has appeared many times before joint select committees and is, from what I understand, scheduled to appear before other select committees uh, in the in the very near future. So that um, it's just the objectives of the inquiries we are basically focusing on on water security. Uh, we don't intend to get into all the detailed operations and nitty gritties and all of those things um, regarding the regarding the authority itself, but more um, broad based um, policy and directives regarding ensuring water security as the based on the objectives that I outlined at the beginning. So, member member Jennings Smith. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very specific. Um, uh, I want to refer my first question to Wasa. And um, I want to refer to your own submission on page seven, where you indicated that four booster stations are to be constructed or upgraded in Northwest Trinidad. The contracts are to be awarded and work is expected to be completed in the third quarter of 2020. Now I represent the constituency of Toko Sangri Grandi, and I have complaints from those people every single month. In particular, the people from Matura and San Grande and the outlying areas. But I want to specifically focus on this question right now. You said that storage tanks have been constructed and commissioned at Four Roads, Digo Martin, Tucker Valley, Chagarama, Sululu, Cascade, and Charlottesville, Tobago, with two additional to be commissioned in Quarry, Valencia, and Guanapu. And you also said that communities to benefit include, include Carinage, Pitti Valley, Digo Martin, St. Anne's, Arima, Calvary Hill, Valencia, and Charlottesville. Given the work that is expected to be completed in the third quarter of 2020 for the four booster station, can you provide details on the status of the award of contract, the tendering process used to select the contracts, the contracts course, and the contractor selected for the work? Okay, first, with respect to the, to the um, it's four, four booster stations. Yes. We are at the stage where the, the physical work, um, we have signed the contracts and so on with the, with the vendors, and um, the work is scheduled to, to um, commence shortly. Um, I'll let Ms. Leasing Pereira provide the details of that. Um, the two contractors that were selected, they, they, it was an open tender, and um, the two contract, it was two contractors um, Toshiba Water is one, and the other is the Rampasad. Okay, great. Um, could you tell me the status to the two additional storage tanks to be commissioned in Quarry, Valencia, and Guanapu? And let, when will these be commissioned? Right. So I'll let, I'll let Ms. Leasing Pereira provide right, so the details. The, the Quarry and the Guanapu tanks, they're approximately 95% complete. Right now what we're working on is the interconnecting pipe work to, to just to complete, to put those tanks into service. But those tanks are completed, 95%, substantially complete, and it's just the pipe work now to close it off. Can you give me a timeline testing. as to when it will be commissioned? Because I realize that Valencia, residents of Valencia will get some level of impact in terms of supply of water. So could you tell me when you look right. at So you're we anticipate at. by the ending of this month, March, that those tanks should be placed on, on, on commission. I have another question for the chairman. Now, you're aware that there is a, um, a station in Matura, and I've been there in office for the past four years, and I've been asking questions about that particular water um, booster station in Matura. I, I believe that the problem still exists. Can you give me an update as to what's really happening in Matura? And I know you are very well aware because I have been coming having um, continued discussion with the area manager about that particular booster station in Matura. Um, did, would this be the Matura, the, the treatment plant in Matura? Yes, the treatment plant in Matura. Because there is a problem with the tank, the pump, that every time rain falls, there is no water. And um, consistently, it has been happening over the past few years. Can you tell me if any improvement work was done? And if so, what was done? No, no improvement work um, would have been done yet at that station. But based on what you've described, 
um, the plant as it is um, would need, uh, we'd need to review the treatment process. What would occur during periods of heavy rainfall? You'll get a, a, decree, uh, a deterioration in the raw water quality, um, which will result in, in, in what you described. So we will have to review that, that, that process. Um, I've asked the Director of Operations, but he doesn't have first hand information, so we'll have to provide an update. And last All question right. is that, um, can you tell me where does residents of the Sangre Grande and outlying area get water supply from? Uh, Sangre Grande is supplied primarily from the North Orapooch Water Treatment Plant. Uh, we do also have <coughs> localized wells to um, supplement the supply within Sangre Grande itself. Has any work been identified in terms of, with regard to the supply of water to these areas within the last two years? Uh, the, the, we have had issues with the um, wells in San Grande, and we're currently working on those to have them back up to, to full production. Um, other than that, well, the, the, the North Orapooch, we have done work at North Orapooch, which will have benefited. Okay, thank you very much. Um, your submission also indicated that a list of high leakage means has been developed by WASA, which takes into account the rate of leakage. Which areas are most affected by leaking means? Um, the leaking means would be across Trinidad and Tobago. Okay. So there, there's no no area that I can at this point pinpoint to say this one is worse. Than so in other words, um, there will not be a, an opportunity to say that you have a priority listing to deal with those leaking areas? We, we would, there would be a, a listing that has been prioritized based on the, the level of leakage, um, and that could be provided. So, can you, so you, you can provide this committee with a list of the priority listing? Correct, yes. Okay, thank you. Madam okay. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so we're dealing with water security today, and a lot of what you have submitted to us speaks to the objective that WASA is trying to achieve, which is supply of water, 24-7 uh, supply of water to a large percentage of the population. Um, I've noticed, not just over the last year, probably before that as well, in treating with the amount of water in our reservoirs that WASA has been putting out the percentage of water in the reservoir to let the population know exactly what is there. And this comes in quite handy. Uh, my first question is, based on the data you have, the amount of water in those reservoirs, has it been trending upwards or downwards over time? The, the, the levels in the reservoirs, due to the, the variations between dry and wet season, I mean, the dry season, we could expect it to go down, and the wet season is replenished. Um, we do get from year to year variations or fluctuations that occur. Um, last year, in particular, the dry season was particularly harsh, and the wet season, we had below normal rainfall. Um, I think I, the, I attended a conference on Adopter River um, recently, and it was stated that the overall the rainfall is decreasing, uh, which would mean that the water in our reservoirs, because we draw water from rainfall, um, that, that would be impacted. There's a reason I asked that question, because what you're saying is absolutely true, but based on data, you would be able to tell if it's going to be trending downwards. We all know about climate change, we all know the effect that is having worldwide. One of the effects in Trinidad and Tobago is that in the rainy season, you'll get shorter periods of rainfall, so more water in a shorter period, which ironically doesn't really affect the reservoirs. In other words, it doesn't fill them up. And the dry season is a little bit longer, it's a little bit drier, and you don't get as much rainfall as whatnot. My point is this. The data should be able to tell you, whether it be 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, if it's trending downwards, you might be able to get a rate at which it's trending downwards, and the question is, what plans are you all putting in place, given that the wider population doesn't know this? And in order to conserve water, they would need to know this 
change their behaviors so that we can you know, mitigate that problem. Okay, well, I think the PS in her opening remarks had, had intimated at a program that we are looking at currently uh, well, through the ministry um, with the IDB uh, to look at the, the entire water cycle with respect to, to improvements in that regard. And certainly storage of water will be on that program. Uh, we need to also look, uh, and you indicated it, uh, the water balance is supply and demand. So we need to ensure that the demand part of it is, is managed as well. Insofar as, as the supply, which is the part you are, you are speaking of, um, we do need to increase the storage that we, we have. And also we need to look at and have been looking at the variations that have occurred from years ago um, to now where, that it appears uh, to the layman that we have shorter duration, higher intensity events. Um, some of our facilities are what we call pump storage facilities. So they, they don't only capture water within their catchment, we get water from um, adjoining catchments and pump it up to, to, the, uh, to the reservoir. So that, that needs to be looked at in terms of do we need more capacity to deal with the shorter duration, high intensity rainfall events to capture that water as well. Um, so the, all of that is part of the process towards having water security. Okay, so I, I understand where you're coming from with that. Um, one of my major concerns is that we have no control um, in, as human beings in relation to how much rain falls in the rainy season. So if it is that for where we are located geographically, uh, we are seeing a trending downwards in the amount of rainfall that we are getting in the rain season. That is the starting point of the water table. Not the water table, the water cycle, sorry. And everything changes. So for example, you may find that a particular well you've dug, which was dug to a particular depth because of an aquifer, uh, you may need to dig a little deeper to get the same amount of water. Um, the reason I was talking about the population is because the snapshot of where we are in Trinidad and Tobago right now is that one, you're not providing 24 seven supply to 100% of the population. That's one. Two, what you are supplying those who are getting water, there's problems with leakages and whatnot. But yet the reservoirs that we have are saying that they're, they're not where we are comfortable for them to be. So if it is that we are not running at maximum level, but the reservoirs are still not where we're comfortable, then I am, I am hard pressed to see how we are going to you know, do better with that, given that the overall rainfall is seeming as though it's, it's getting less with climate change. So my point is, we're going down a road of, well, yes, we want to give 24-7 supply to as many people as we can in Trinidad and Tobago. But are you going to hit a, a problem where you're just not going to find the water? The first thing in my mind is changing the behavior. We need to move from water is bountiful and plentiful because we're on a tropical island close to the equator to what Las Vegas and California and these places are doing, which is you need to be conserving as much water as possible because you know what? There's just not enough. And they have a whole reuse policy and plan, sorry, in terms of dealing with their water supply. So are we moving from free use of water to conserving water because the trend is telling us we're going to run out if we keep going this? That, that's what I want to hear from Wasa. Is, is that what we're, we're doing? Well, the message of conservation, um, we have been, been ha putting that to, to the public. And this was um, even two or three years ago before we had that bad dry season last year. So conservation and demand management as a whole needs to be done together with the, the, uh, the water winning projects. When we look at the volumes of water we produce, we have we should have enough water to, to supply um, the public uh, because of is well.
Right. Well, it may be a bit long to, 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 to project, um, but we have, um, I say we do look, the primary source of water we currently have would be surface water sources, which account for about 60%, 58 to 60% of our production. So our focus is always there to try to ensure that we protect that. Um, we do have groundwater, and we have been looking at, as I said, can we store more, more surface water to add security of supply to that, that component? And in terms of the groundwater, we are looking at alternative uh, previously untapped aquifers that would have significant volumes of water and that have not yet been tapped, that those, those we are looking to, to utilize as well. Mr. Punking, um, you, you mentioned about the, um, with regards to the cons conservation that member De Freitas is asking about, but how comprehensive and how aggressive have been your water conservation programs? How effective have, have, have they been thus far? Okay, the water conservation uh, initiative, we start at the school level. We do have a public education center. Uh, so we have started with, with young children into secondary school as well. And we've had different initiatives um, over the years promoting cons con conservation. That is coupled with the, the um, where we have, we currently have a water restriction, wa water hose restriction in place since January of 2019, based on the water availability that we've had. All these are what WASA, under the WASA Act that we are empowered to do. And we have been doing patrols and, and, and um, applying the, the relevant charges and so on to people who are in breach. Uh, but the, I think we have where, where it has to be a consciousness that water is finite and uh, Yes, the punitive measures will continue, but more needs to be that people recognize that this, this resource is something that we have now and we have to treasure it and utilize it properly um, for our personal use, industrial use, commercial use. Um, it, it, it's literally what drives the economy of Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you with those things. And uh, I mean, that has been a language that has been outside here, if, if you don't mind, for decades. And, um, in terms of um, effective, uh, because one, you, from, from your response, it seems as, okay, the enforcement aspect of it, through whatever bylaws and laws uh, under the WASA Act that we can put into place. And the, the level of your res resources to ensure compliance um, with, with, with those laws um, but another aspect really hinges largely on public education and getting across to the public, look, this is a precious finite resource. And as Member Defeaters is saying, it's not going to last forever. And uh, due to, of course, climatic changes and whatever that we are hearing, it's, it's, it's even more imperative that we, we, reduce, uh, we reduce consumption. So I know, yes, the schools, we have been talking and a couple of things. But in terms of, um, do you all have, I mean, a comprehensive public education strategy that um, identifies all facets of cons uh, conservation, how it could be marketed, how, it could, how, how you could enact it with the public? Um, is it, do you have measurables to gain how effective it is being done? And are results being seen in the actual res reduction in consumption? Okay. In, in, in terms of measuring the, the reduction in demand or usage, uh, the, the problem or, or one of the issues that we would face is, is the, the metering component where we have limited metering um, insofar as getting data on usage usage patterns. So the effectiveness, it would be um, difficult to measure. Uh, but it, we have been, uh, I think, getting the message out um, consistent with our plan. And uh, again, the plan that the PS referred to with the IDB 
it's an all, it's a comprehensive proposal and it looks at both su supply and demand issues, including, including metering at, at that point. In time. But, yeah, but specifically in terms of your public education program, could, would you be able to provide this committee with um, such a, a program that what, what you all have in place? That, and, yeah? Yes, that, that, that could be provided. I wanted to, to add to what you're saying a little bit. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a tad bit scared because we are at a stage globally where we are feeling the effects of climate change. We're no longer guessing. We're no longer projecting. We're no longer doing models. A lot of places are feeling the effects. And we are still at a point where we cannot categorically state what the demand is. Because we don't have the meters, it's nobody's fault. Um, but I am worried that as much as you indicated that there's still quite a bit of supply that we haven't tapped into yet. I know how this thing works by way of the water cycle. And I am worried that we're, as we're moving forward and the years roll by, we're not going to be replenishing these, you know, stores that we are dependent on. And we are still not grasping exactly whether through our conservation efforts, if the demand is going down at all. And, I, and that's what the chairman is getting at. Because we need, that is, that is the most important part. That is where we'll have the greatest effect, reducing that demand. But at this current time, what I'm hearing is that we don't even have a way to measure that. Because what I'm hearing right now, coming from Wasa, is that the reservoirs are at 40% or 50%. Please conserve. What I'm hoping that we're hearing, based on empirical data, is the, reservoir, the reservoirs are at 50%. They are not being replenished because of climate change or whatever. If we continue using water the way we continue to use water, we will not have enough to supply the nation by so-and-so date. They do it for oil. They could tell you that with oil. Based on consumption, supply, how much oil is in the ground, estimates. It doesn't have to be 100% accurate, but they can estimate. By a certain year, you're going to run out of oil. This is all data and trends. And if that is the narrative, then it's hard pressed for somebody to say, well, you know, let me continue to use water the same way. The other public education program that could be done is that there's so much technology now, sensors on your taps in your house, that if you're going to wash your hand, you see it in bathrooms, in public spaces, you put your hand under, the water runs for a few seconds and it turns off. People in Trinidad and Tobago are still using, turn on your tap and you leave it while you brush your teeth. That can't continue, given what is coming. But we are not educating from a standpoint of, if we continue down this road, we are all going to be thirsty very soon. And that is what is scaring me. I'm just hoping you take what I say, because it's not, I don't think it's too expensive or something, a hurdle that we can't cross. It's just a matter of getting data out there, changing the narrative, to really let the people know how important this is. We really do have to start conserving water, because when I saw those numbers for those reservoirs for last year, it started to scare me. One bad dry season and we're in trouble. We um, we just continue along the lines. Yes, before before I go to you, um, Member Defreitas mentioned one bad bad dry season, but I shudder to think two consecutive bad dry seasons. What our position would be, or three consecutive bad dry seasons, and based on climatic changes, I don't think I'm stretching my imagination too far, because um, the, the possibilities are there. Um, on the, in your waste water and wastewater infrastructure plan, Mr. Poon King, 2017 to 2022, which you were gracious enough to include, 
um, in your submittals to the um, committee as an appendix. On page two, um, section 2.0 background, you indicated that the per capita consumption in Trinidad and Tobago is extremely high, and uh, indicating that it encompasses both actual consumption and unaccounted for water. Um, from what I understand is that our per capita consumption is, is in the range of, um, you can correct me when you respond, uh, maybe around 580 liters per person per day. And uh, what, what we are aiming for is something substantially lower than that. Um, could you indicate what, um, what percentage of that consumption could be assigned to unaccounted for water out of that figure? And what is the, the target consumption that based on our present situation that the authority has as its target? The, five, the, five eight, or the figure of 580 liters per capita per day includes an unaccounted for water level of approximately 50%. Um, and then, so you'll be left with around 290 liters per capita per day in terms of consumption. Uh, so that figure, um, roughly, it's it's probably about 60 or 70 percent at least above what it should be. So that needs to be reduced um, significantly. This is 290 in addition to the unaccounted for water component. So we need reduction in both, both components. Okay, the, um, in the responses from the Ministry of Public Utilities, the term non-revenue water is used instead of, well, as, um, instead of unaccounted for water, is, is, there, is there a difference in the terminology, uh, unaccounted for water and non-revenue water, just for clarification, uh, let me move on. I think for our purpose it will be interchangeable. Um, the non-revenue water will normally be um, probably more applicable in a metered environment. Um, we are not really metered, so you can use non-revenue non water or unaccounted for water at this time, it will have the same, same meaning. Member Mark. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, let me welcome all the representatives here this evening. The first thing I wanted to um, clarify, based on what Mr. Defretas raised a little earlier, and that has to do with the challenges that we face, particularly in the period of climate change and scarcity of water supplies. In reading a submission made by made to us by the Ministry of Public Utilities. We are told on page six of the ministry submission under institutional arrangements that, and I quote, in Trinidad and Tobago, there's no shortage of water resources. And as you go later on, we are told, and I quote, the challenge is in continuity of supply of water. Could you explain that to the committee so that we could be clear in our minds because we are hearing from our colleagues here that there is a finite supply of water but we are in and reading, rather, that in Trinidad and Tobago, there is no so shortage of water resources. And the challenge is really 
the continuity of the supply of water. Could you elaborate for us, please? Thank you for that question, member. Um, I'll ask our water sector specialist to respond. Thank you. Thank you, PS. When we are looking at the benchmark that the UN has given to define water scarcity, really what they do is they take the amount of water resources that you have available using rainfall and runoff, and they divide it by the number of people that you have in your country. So there's a particular benchmark which TNT surpasses. So according to the UN's benchmark, we have more water per person and than their, their benchmark of water scarcity. The challenge that we have is in providing or treating and distributing this water to supply people. So how we harness this water, um, how we treat it, and then how we distribute it to get to people. Um, while WASA has, been, has done a really good job based on its Caribbean counterparts of giving access or coverage of that water supply. Um, so around 95% of the population is covered. The challenge is in continuing that supply or 24, having 24-7 24 supply. And that really is the problem or the focus of non-revenue water. And just to be clear, non-revenue water is not just leaks or physical losses. It is also what we call commercial losses, which is water, water lost in households and water that is used but not built in households. And because we don't have metering, we, and we have high consumption figures, we tend to use more than water than we are actually built by WASA. Um, uh, Mr. Punta, uh, Mr. Kuhnkin, rather. Given the fact that we have heavy rainfalls when we experience them. Flooding is very dramatic in our country, particularly over the last um, two to three years. The question of storage came up a short while ago. Is WASA taking measures or steps to construct more dams in Trinidad and Tobago in order to preserve, to conserve water that is in excess supply? during the rainy season, having regard to all the global challenges that we are familiar with. And when we look at what took place last year and what can be repeated this year and beyond, is WASA taking any measure or initiatives to construct dams so that when we have, as I said, excess water through flooding, the water can be captured, treated, preserved, and utilized in periods of heavy, um, or in periods of, let's say, scarcity. Could you help me in that area? Okay, when, when, um WASA has four impounding reservoirs, three in Trinidad, one in Tobago. When those would have been constructed, I think the primary objective of those particular projects would have been a, from a water supply perspective. So for example, within the Karani River Basin, we have the Arena Reservoir. And while we store water there for water production purposes, ultimately when you have a flood event and we are drawing water off of the river um, to put into storage, that, in fact, does contribute in, a, in, a, in some way to a, a reduction in the extent of flooding that may occur. I think the, we, ha we are looking at, at increasing our impounded storage. I think but the thinking now is a little bit different in that we're looking for projects that would not only provide, provide um, that would provide water supply, but also 
provide for a flood mitigation component. So we are, um, through the ministry, looking at, at projects in Kumuto and um, for the Ravine Sab sand pits um, to provide both water supply and flood mitigation um, going forward. Any time frame? So. Um, well, that, that um, again, the, the PS would have indicated the, the IDB um, program, and that whole consideration is, is within that, that program. You want to, as you talk about the IDB, you seem to have a lot of um, relations with that institution. Um, maybe you can commit pen to paper and share with us how many um, loans you have with the IEDB and um, for what purposes have these loans been contracted and um, the value of these loans and for what period of time we have to, um, these loans are for. I think that would be useful for us to understand what is taking place. You can put that in writing and submit it. Let me ask the acting permanent secretary. You told us in your submission that the ministry is responsible for certain policy and high level strategy. And that is a deal with water security. Do you have a policy, a written policy given that you set policies to deal with water security, is there a policy in the Ministry of Public Utilities on water security in TNT? Remember in 2018, uh, the Ministry would have finalized the revised National Integrated Water Resource Management Policy um, this was submitted to cabinet in early 2019 and is pending a decision. The, this policy would have uh, succeeded a previous policy in 1999 that WASA was uh, charged with effecting, but it would have gone further to look at integrated water resource management and to speak to some of the areas that, uh, some of the things that must be put in place in order for us to have effective water supply and quality water supply. Even though the policy has not yet been approved, uh, building on that policy initiative of 1999, WASA is in fact implementing some activities that speak to areas of the integrated water resource management policy. And I'll just ask, if I may, my water sector specialist to elaborate on what some of those initiatives are. But before he does that, mm -hmm. um, can you share with us what is the current status of this policy um, that has been submitted? I don't know if you're in a position to do so, but um, from what I have read, this policy would have been submitted to the cabinet. Um, was it in February of 2019, if I'm not mistaken? We are talking about one year and maybe going into some days later. Um, can you share with us from your perspective, Permanent Secretary, and from the Ministry's perspective, can you brief this committee as to the current status of this policy that has been submitted and remains outstanding? Member, unfortunately, I'm not in a position right at this point to do that, but I can inquire and let the committee know. All right, well, could you... Oh, no, please, before, um, before we go to your water sector specialist, I, I just have one or two <coughs> observations regarding that integrated water resources management policy. So I'll just identify those so that maybe it could be dealt with in, in, the, in, in the response at the same time. I think the integrated water resources management policy is a step in the right direction. It, it does tie in with the um, sustainable 
sustainable development goals that has been outlined for 2030. And really and truly, we need an integrated approach to water, water management, water security, um, as adopted by many countries now throughout the world. Um, a couple of things with regards to the policy in that one is that, um, um, from what I gather, is that a certain entity, it, it hasn't been given a name as yet, it, it, was not, it has not been given a name in the policy per se, but a specific entity would be given certain leader responsibilities in terms of um, coordinating, I think there's a matrix that is attached to the policy, and just a rough check I did, almost there are 22 other stakeholders in, in the water industry that is on that matrix. Some of them have lead responsibilities, but this certain entity that is being identified has certain lead responsibilities. It's, it's just that, um, you know, I would have thought that the policy would have gone a bit further um, at, this, uh, at this stage. Um, it would have clearly identified probably in a bit more detail the role and responsibilities of the identity, of, of the entity. And bearing in mind the, the, the paradox with the Water Resources Agency in particular, where we have the Water Resources Agency lodged in Wasa, um, so both the, abstr the abstractor of water and the regulator of water is within the same body um, it would have addressed that anomaly in more detail and made a definitive recommendation that the Water Resources Agency be removed from the ambit of WASA. And maybe even gone to so far as to say, look, in the formulation of this new entity that would be responsible for the integrated water resources management of the country, maybe the Water Resources Agency could be the seed agency removed from WASA and be allowed to develop, seeing that it has a, a foundational basis already, and that agency be, be looked at to form the, the framework for a new integrated water resources agency with clear and definitive rules. Remember, your point is taken. Um, maybe when we speak to where the policy is now at, there may be room to relook that. That's something we can look at when we see what is happening with the policy before its approval. All right, it's just that um, I, I am no, aware it why, why it wasn't done uh, uh, um, together with the policy, because um, also, um, I, to me, the policy did not address really the, um, I mean, there are, there are certain legislation in place including the WASA Act. But um, the, the amount of legislation that, that is there that impacts on water and water security is that um, the policy did not really go into any uh, detailed investigation or even preliminary investigation at this stage into the sort of legislative framework that such an entity would have to be given in order for it to function effectively in terms of the lead responsibilities that have been assigned to it in the policy. Because that legislative framework, I mean, the work has to be done, a review of all legislation pertaining to water, <coughs> and um, what the role of this entity is intended to be, <coughs> and what are the, <coughs> sorry, what, are the, what is the necessary legislation, whether new or amended legislation, that has to be put in place. And I just felt that the policy should have addressed that at least a first pass in, in that regard. Okay, so um, at this time, to... yeah, so at this time we would like to invite uh, the inputs from your uh, water sector specialists. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The, ju just to go back a little bit, um, and I think this is, is con to contextualize our goal for water security. Integrated water resources management is not something that is unique to Trinidad and Tobago. It's actually a global process. 
um, that's being championed by one of the UN's agencies. But really, it speaks to the fact that water has a direct link with other with land use planning, with the water environment, and in order to manage water resources, it requires integration and coordination with other managers of water. So that the agricultural sector, um, watershed, or forestry, um, climatology, and those type of agencies. So there's a particular model for that integrated water resources management, which the policy follows. Um, so it looks at the enabling environment, so in the institution legislation, which you mentioned. Um, then the institutional setup, um, which, which you're referring to, this, this agency that will manage water resources. And the policy says clearly that the, the agency, whoever that is, um, will manage, monitor, and regulate water resources. So it is calling, in essence, for a separation of the functions of water resources management that now lie with WASA through its water resources agency. And of course, it recognizes that that institutional capacity exists in the, in the water resources agency. So a number of models for the institutional setup of the organization have been put forward, um, including utilizing the water resources agency services, um, because that is really where the capacity is. And that, that has been put forward um, for, for a decision. And actually, this separation is not, not new. Um, it's been going on since the early 2000s, where the recommendation was made um, out of a, a strategy that was funded by the World Bank to set up a resource regulator. So your, your policy maker, which is the ministry, should be separated from your service provider, which is the utility, should be separated from the resource regula regulator, which is WRA. Um, so the, the legislative groundwork actually exists. What we are waiting on is a policy decision as to whether this is we are going to adopt as a country integrated water resources management, which has particular benchmarks of institution management, financial, and the enabling environment. Could, could, this, committee, could this committee be provided with um, just two items of information that you mentioned? One, the, the model framework for this um, what integrated water resources management agency, and two, the, the, the legislative findings that you refer to. Yes, may I, may I continue, Mr. Chairman? Um, in your submission, Acting Permanent Secretary, you indicated that the public involvement in protection, conservation, management of watersheds constitute a central focus when it comes to the security of water supply. I was interested in the management of our watersheds. First of all, can you identify where these watersheds are located? Could you also advise this committee whether public education initiatives on the protection and conservation of these watersheds have been pursued, what initiatives have been taken in that regard in terms of education? And to what extent these exercises that I've mentioned have been successful in protecting and conserving our watersheds? So the three-part question to get some clarification on. Okay, member. Um, well, if you want to put them in writing, you can do that, but you can give us a tight summary of these concerns. I think that uh, the WRA will be able to address the questions that you have been asked. Good afternoon, member. With respect to watersheds in Trinidad and Tobago, there is 
55 watersheds in Trinidad and 14 watersheds in Tobago. A watershed is defined as an area where rain, when rain falls, they come to a common point. So all of the land surface would be part of a particular watershed. Um, with respect to management of the watersheds, the Water Resources Agency works closely with other entities who have regulatory functions. For example, we have EMA. When a project is proposed and they see that there would be some potential impact on the water resources, they would write to us and ask for our input into the proposed project. So it could be with regard to um, whether its surface runoff is going to be impacted or infiltration into our, into our aquifers will be impacted and so forth. So we have a very close relationship with the EMA with regard to projects and their impacts on the water resources. In addition, the Water and Surge Authority is part of the Mineral Advisory Committee, which basically reviews applications for mining and quarrying. Um, so it, this Mineral Advisory Committee would review mining applications and the membership of this MAC is comprised of Ministry of Works and Transport, EMA, Ministry of Health, um, uh, Ministry of Finance, um, Town and Country Planning. And we basically try to work together to ensure what is being proposed would have as minimal impact as possible on the water resources. Um, so overall, we try to use our relationships, um, even though with regard to legislation, that we are really doesn't have any legislation on its own in order to, to move forward with management of the water resources. Um, in addition, we have a public education component and as well as working with grassroots organizations. And that program is called the Adopt a River Program. And that's basically to get the citizens in a watershed to become stewards of the environment. The Adopt River program would train water warriors in the communities, and we basically would educate them on, in the role of protection of their water resources. We train them to do simple water quality testing so that they could monitor their watersheds. Um, we have meetings at uh, schools, primary schools, high schools, in order to foster this greater stewardship because the young people, they're probably more in tune with what's going on and they could help guide the adults and nudge them along the right direction. May I ask, um, you can put in writing, where these watersheds located in Trinidad and Tobago. And um, if you can also indicate to this committee, sir, uh, how successful have we been so far in preserving and ensuring longevity as it relates to these watersheds, re-management of it, and conservation of same? Could you just share with us, you know, what is the experience, or what the experience has been like thus far in preserving, conserving these watersheds? Could I also just add, add a couple of things to what Mr. Gosain has um, indicated and what Member Mark is asking for. Uh, Mr. Gosain, the, could, you, could you safely identify, or is there, clear identifiable agency that is responsible for water shed management in Trinidad and Tobago? Or is it spread among several um, stakeholders? Um, it's spread among various stakeholders. Um, when you look at the drainage division, they give approvals of projects with regard to impacting 
um, uh, river courses, right? So a lot of the projects, developments, will have to get uh, drainage approval for, for, for any kind of development. You also have town and country planning department, and they basically would have to look at the current land use, and they may have to um, modify the land use um, if that if there is a particular project that is going to be um, going to be done. Um, of course, we have the the EMA, whereby they'll they issue a certificate of environmental clearance with regard that the. Um, that give their, um, their conditions with respect to that proposed project. However, if they sense that the project is of too great a scope, they would require an environmental impact assessment before they would issue a CC. So those are the key um, entities, drainage division, town and country planning department, and, and EME that basically have legislation whereby they have a role to play with regard to watershed management. Okay, thank you. But um, it, it seems as though there are no clear lead, ag lead agency that has a primary responsibility for watershed management. And I'm just wondering in terms of the integrated water resource management approach, whether we'll be going in that direction in terms of the agency, the IWRM agency that would be charged with that primary responsibility for watershed management. Because from what I've looked at in terms of the responses that have been sent, it's, it seems as though the integrated water resource management approach is, is also um, significantly suggesting that the supply of water as much as possible should be maximized from within the watershed resources itself. I mean, we have cases where water is treated in Karani and sent all the way down to South Trinidad, engaging, you know, miles and miles of transmission lines and other than capital costs, the maintenance and the booster stations and everything that's required to take that water from Karani and get it all down to South. And the integrated water management approach would be to say, well, look, within the watersheds themselves, these, this is, these are the potential sources of water. And we try to treat, we try to uh, extract, treat, and distribute within the watersheds itself, rather than cross watersheds distribution. Obviously, I, I, the thinking is that uh, the benefits of minimizing cross watershed transmission is, of course, cost and uh, getting the communities more involved and more active stakeholders in conserving what their watershed is producing. And um, I, I, I hope that the, the policy that we are looking at really would um, seek to maximize this aspect of, of, of the watershed management and the extraction of and distribution of water within the watershed itself. Um, well, with respect to the IWRM policy, um, basically, it's basically a, a decentralization of that process whereby you have all these entities, these key stakeholders working together. Um, but in, in terms of, I think we just need to be working closer together much more to ensure that there's no gaps. Um, with respect to water within different watersheds, um, when you look at the rainfall occurring in Trinidad, the areas with the heaviest rainfall is primarily the northeast, right? Uh, an area of concentration would be like uh, Hollis Reservoir. In addition, where we have the location of our aquifers, um, we have some areas whereby you, you really don't have too many aquifers in that geographic area. As a result, they do basically export water out of watersheds. But you're, you're right in the sense that overall, um, when you look at, for example, the United States, you have basically they would not allow water out of major river basins. Like you have the Great Lakes Compact, 
between the Great Lakes states of the US and the, um, those uh, provinces of Canada that share the Great Lakes. So you basically have those kind of things in place to not export water out of large areas. But I think here in Trinidad, because of some of the population centers being in areas where rainfall is not as much as the Northeast, for example, in Northwest, um, we have really no choice but to basically bring in water from where it is more abundant. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I think um, I see Mr. Kerr is here, and um, we have been talking a fair amount about climate change and its impact on the water security. I had the privilege of hearing, hearing Mr. Kerr um, deliver a short paper when we had an inter-parliamentary union uh, seminar, um, I think sometime late last year. And um, in terms of the, the whole uh, impact of climate change, in terms of where, what we are looking at, um, and in, from the view of the work of the Met Office, uh, I'm asking in terms of risk assessment and projections based on certain climatic conditions, the present case, um, what, what scenarios, what, what analysis are we looking at or have we done to, to come up with um, projections in, in terms of, um, I, I know long term is difficult, but in terms of medium term, short term, medium term impact on um, water, water availability and water resources. Because um, Mr. Putin King mentioned about the surface water and the impact of the rainfall. Um, is there marked isohyatal shifts um, coming out of uh, rainfall patterns over the years and what is projected for the short term? And also of concern is that, remember, although it's groundwater and we are extracting from, from wells, the, the recharge of those aquifers uh, it's dependent on, on, on surface water. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening again. And I want to just place it in context of Member Defreitas, the question that he would have asked. And our analysis shows that we are seeing a decline in rainfall. The last decade, 2010 to 2019, when we compared the cumulative rainfall to the 1961 to 1990 30-year period, we seen that that decade was 5% less. When we compare the same decade with 1981 to 2010, we seen that the cumulative rainfall was a whole 11% less than that period. When we do decade to decade, we see that the last decade has Cumulative produced the least amount of decadal rainfall since 1970 or the late 1960s. So we are definitely seeing a trend with respect to the decline in rainfall. And the projections is for that trend to continue. So for us, we have looked at the ISA Hyatel and we have seen that there is a trend across Trinidad and Tobago. And the, the challenge, though, is that with respect to the extremes, it depends on which index or which in metrics you use. Some are increasing, some are decreasing. But be that as it may, uh, even to the point that Member Defreitas made with respect to the high intense rainfall events, we are seeing the top 1% of the heaviest rainfall events or those that are occurring at the 99th percentile are contributing more rainfall to the annual average. So the rainfall that we are witnessing is actually very, very intense, and therefore the ability to capture that becomes even more a challenge where the overall deficit in rainfall is occurring. So for us, we are seeing these trends and we are hopeful that we in Trinidad and Tobago can climate proof our water resource management. To that extent, the Met Office has introduced a number of products that we provide to the water resource management agency 
that speaks directly to water security and has to some degree enabled the Water Resource Management Agency to really help WASA with managing the water resource to the extent that we are a little more comfortable now than we would have been had it not been for those kind of products and services. In the, in the catchments where the reservoirs are located the four, uh, for the four major dams that uh, Mr. Poon King mentioned, um, is it definitive that we are getting less rainfall in those catchments? And the trend is that we are going to continue to get at least less rainfall in those catchments? Well, let me put this in context. Uh, we are seeing the trends, but each year is not the same. Uh, in the last six years, it's informative to see that four of those six years in all the, 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 the reservoir areas were within the 10% or 25%, the lowest 10 and 25% of the historical rainfall. So we are seeing those trends and, and they are happening more frequently now. Um, one of the other things that we have to place there is that the El Nino phenomena typically brings much drier than usual conditions in Trinidad and Tobago. And since 2010 to now, we had this unusual um, phenomena where we see uh, three significant El Nino events in terms of the impacts happening in a, in a relatively short period of time. So those are the nuances that are happening within the rainfall distribution that has direct linkage to water security in Trinidad and Tobago. You know, one aspect of, based on all the response we have gotten is, is the whole thing about rainfall harvesting, uh, maybe particularly for um, agricultural use, but at the same time not, not discounting it in terms of um, possible sources for winning water that could be treated and put into for possible use. Um, is the Met Office in a position based on the work that you all are doing? To point in any sp to any specific regions or catchments where, um, in terms of rainfall trends and patterns, that rain rainfall harvesting could could be optimized. Unfortunately, we are not able to pinpoint that. But what I can say is that uh, the country, in, in general, needs to move to a level where we utilize rainwater harvesting in greater ways. As an example, um, in, in Australia, it, rainwater harvesting has been incentivized to the extent that it has a greater uptake in residents, and it has been incentivized in a way where uh, if you connect your toilets or your washing machine to a rainwater tank, then you get a particular payout from the government, and then the government, uh, by policy um, ensures that the education system, the schools, have rainwater harvesting to, to flush their toilets. And I feel that in Trinidad and Tobago, policies to that effect can be um, used to really bring the change of behavior in Trinidad and Tobago. Okay, my my follow-up question is whether the, the Ministry of Public Utilities uh, and WASA, in terms of um, offering incentives for, for the use of rainwater, um, even in terms of um, the construction of um, cisterns and underground cisterns, which a lot of the islands is standard. You're building a house, you do an underground cistern at the same time. Um, whether it, in terms of, are there any, um, any plans from the ministry or WASA to, to accelerate um, or to, to um, give more impetus to the whole aspect of rain, rainfall harvesting out, outside of um, the agricultural sector. Okay. Um, we are actually, at this point in time at the ministry, um, conducting some further research into the whole rainwater harvesting and how we can put it to use. Um, in terms of WASA's uh, system. And um, we had one or two uh, programs that we wanted to use to 
make it complementary to, but we are still conducting that research. Mr. Chair, I just um, I want to jump in here and ask a question. Maybe the ministry might know it or WASA might know this offhand. Which months in Trinidad and Tobago do we get the highest amount of rainfall, or usually? Uh, I'll ask Mr. Good. Uh, at some stations, uh, it's difficult to assess a particular month given how rainfall occurs irregularly in Trinidad and Tobago. So what you may find is that on the northeastern areas, the month of August uh, is the highest producing month, whereas in the western areas, the month of June is the, is the highest. And then in Tobago, the month of November is the highest. So it depends on, on, on a number of climatic background factors. But what we are seeing, for example, is that the late wet season, at Piaco in particular, we see what we call a wetting in that uh, October, November, December, over time, since 1946 to now, the cumulative rainfall for those three months have increased and increased statistically significant. The last three months of, of the year. Because um, the reason I was asking that question is I just quickly got some data uh, from the press releases at WASA put out last year, and I've noticed that in March, um, using Hollis, we saw that there was 63.34% capacity. And just a mere five months later, in August of the same year, Hollis dropped to 18.91% capacity. That's five months. It's a precipitous drop in five months. And I was just trying to compare that to where the rainfall was. Um, because, you know, most people don't understand this, but it's not a, a black and white line that you go through for dry season and wet season. It sort of blends. Um, so, you know, it's not June and then all of a sudden there's a great amount of rain or whatnot. Um, and the reason I'm asking that is because that's just one year. And, you know, when you go over a decade, for example, you can pick up trends. Does WASA take into account that type of data to sort of determine how it distributes its water? So let me just go a little further. For February, it's being reported already, Hollis is at 3.07, that's 2020. And obviously we'll wait to see what happens in August. But is WASA looking at that and then taking that into account to say, well, listen, in the month of June, July, and August, the population of Trinidad and Tobago, given the fact that we at the tail end of the dry season, so we haven't had much rain, and the reservoir is expected to drop that low, because that's, that's pretty low, 18% is, is pretty low. Uh, you know, do they put programs in place to ramp it up outside of the cons cons telling the population to conserve? What else are you all doing? To sort of treat with that. But we don't want this year we find out it's at 15 or 10 if that's where it's trending based on what the gentleman said just a few moments ago. Well, as Mr. Kuh had indicated, um, he does his analysis and within WASA through the Water Resources Agency, we do do our projections for the reservoirs and produce water at, at the treatment plants based on those projections. So we do look at, at what is proposed. As, as I indicated, the last dry season was particularly harsh. And we amend our production levels to match the water that, that is available to ensure we have continuity of supply. So I, I think, in fact, we just got from Mr. Kerr projection yesterday. So again, we'll be reviewing and amending uh, as required. This might be a little bit um, premature. So you, what projections you all have for August of this year? Would it be just as bad or would it be better? I think I'll let um, Mr. Gosain at WRA, he has some projections for the coming. I don't know if you have them on you, but. Good afternoon, member. 
So um, we received uh, the six month rainfall outlook um, yesterday and staff is currently basically trying to do the assessment. So the information I have is basically about a month old. Um, Med service provides basically um, three forecasts. One is called the outlook, which is the, the best estimate of the expected rainfall. They have an upper threshold and a lower threshold. For water supply purposes, it's prudent to use the lower threshold to help guide. Um, but we do two, um, two uh, assessments, one for normal rainfall expected, um, and then the lower threshold rainfall. So um, because it's a six month um, forecast we receive, this went from February to July, right? So um, based on that, um, and did you have a particular, res Hollis, you said? Okay, um, well, we had a low point um, in terms of capacity at Arena um, and occurring at the end of June, and 29.9% at the end of June. If we get the lower threshold rainfall from February through July, right? That, that, that's the lower end of the rainfall, okay. That's right. correct, right? So it's basically a worst case scenario. And when you're trying to stack for each month, um, however, as we've realized, um, sometimes rainfall, actual rainfall can be even less than the lower threshold. That has happened at times. Um, for Navet, um, we're in a better situation there. The low point would be at the end of May, and it will be about 44.4% full. Navet has a redundant system whereby there's a lower reservoir. And the dam is on an adjacent watershed, so water can be pumped from that lower reservoir to the upper reservoir. So um, that redundancy is of benefit to the authority. Um, Hollis, the low point will be at the end of May, and that would be 34.3% capacity. Um, and the production we, we estimated um, to be five MGD. So if you produce more, the end of month capacity, I mean, the level will be less, right? So is that interplay? And at Hillsborough, Hillsborough is presently above average. Um, and uh, the low point would be um, in July, 38%. Uh, That, that, that okay. sounds really good. Just, just to continue on, based on the projections that you've had for uh, the lowest amount of rainfall that is projected to occur between that five month period, at least two of the four that you've called out will be above what it was last year. And I think it's only one, which is the first one, is arena. If you hit that low mark, that will come in at lower than last year. So the projections sound good to me. And like I said, it's instructive to the population to at least know that so that they could in terms of their conservation, if they keep conserving, it could only benefit wasa and you know, water security. Um, a mark? In terms of performance indicators, in order to assess, to benchmark wasa against regional and international utilities and against its own progress over time. How does WASA rank against regional and international utilities? That's one. And how has WASA performed over the last few years in terms of its five 
performance indicators that you have identified. So that's the first question I'd like you to pay attention to. The other one, I know Wasa has a lot of challenges. And to overcome your infrastructural challenges, even your institutional barriers, you need revenue. So you go to IADB, as you said earlier, and then you get funding from the state through subsidies, subventions. Could you inform this committee why WASA, in the face of a crisis of cash, would have allowed its receivables to reach this astronomical level of $1.6 billion. Could you share with us why WASA would have allowed this to happen, and what measures, aggressive measures, are being taken by WASA to address this huge and astronomical levels as it relates to your receivables of what I have seen to be about 1.6 billion TT dollars. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but that is what we are seeing. So, that, so my first question went to the performance indicators, and the second one is in a crisis of cash environment. Why has WASA allowed its receivables to reach that level? So madam, please. Yes, member, thank you for the question. Um, in terms of how WASA stacks up against other utilities, I believe that was part of your first question. Yes. I will ask our um, water sector specialist to speak to how WASA um, stacks up in terms of coverage and service to the citizenry as well as to speak to some of the elements of the strategic pillars that we spoke about earlier, like operational efficiency and so on. And then I'll ask the DPS to share with us some of the reporting that WASA does based on what we have asked of them. Before Mem you do, uh, Madam Governor Secretary, um, I think the member um, also specifically um, refer to the performance indicators that you have in your response. You had five performance indicators, I think, yes, that you have alluded and to. And the uh, water so sector specialist will speak to them. Yeah, to measure against those specific indicators? Yes, she will. Oh, okay, thank you. All right. Okay. We've set five strategic pillars, um, and each of these pillars have performance um, indicators, and we've defined what we actually want WASA to report on. Um, and specific to, so one of the so five indicators which you have, um, one of them is a customer-centric culture. And we are measuring that by the WASA's response and handling of complaints, um, as well as the time it takes to process things like a new connection, as well as a completion certificate, which is in WASA's control. Um, on the operational efficiency side, we are looking at their leak repair and road restoration status, as well as their coverage and production of water, as well as water storage. Um, financial viability, we have a bunch of financial metrics which include um, their EBITDA margin, their receivables turnover ratio, as you mentioned, um, their liquidity, and their inventory turnover ratio. 
we were also um, re requiring that they perf that they report on governance um, and governance the indicators for governance are specific to business continuity um, how they have been able to implement their preparedness and response strategies in times of a disaster as well as their statutory submissions to both the ministry as well as the the parliament and then the fifth indicator is I think that was five, um, yeah, financial viability, customer centric. Um, how WASA performs relative to other entities um, in the Caribbean, so both the ministry as well as regional um, research bodies such as the Inter-American Development Bank um, have done sort of performance benchmarking assessments of WASA. Um, and as I mentioned before, water coverage um, is pretty high compared to other regional utilities. Um, WASA, WASA is the second best um, performing utility with 95% service coverage um, behind Barbados and Belize, which is at 100. Um, water co waste water coverage, sorry. Um, WASA is, is ranking the highest um, regional utility in terms of centralized sewage coverage, which is around 30% coverage in all of Trinidad and Tobago. The rest, of course, are septic tanks. Um, regionally, the numbers vary between 2 to 17 percent. Um, on the non-revenue water side, which is another efficiency indicator that both the ministry as well as, as other entities use, um, a lot of the regional utilities battle with non-revenue water. So WASA has the average, the estimate is around 40 to 50 percent, and most of the utilities are around that, um, with Jamaica at 60 percent, and most of the other utilities are actually tackling that. So potentially that number would have gone down um, in the last two years. Um, from a governance and sort of financial perspective, um, it, and it leads back to WASA's, WASA's tariff, WASA has the lowest water tariff um, in the region, and I think only Suriname within this, this hemisphere has, has a lower tariff than, than WASA. And of course, that um, spirals into all of the other problems relative to their operations, as well as um, their, their receivable situation. Um, again, I mean, their account receivable days is pretty high compared to other utilities. Um, but one thing just to note is that from a legislative perspective, Trinidad and Tobago ha probably has the most dated water act in the region. So it speaks to a wider issue of, of governance and how we have been managing our sector as a whole, um, not, just, not just the utility. Yes, Mr. Bonte, can you help us with the next question? Yeah, regarding the receivables, the 1.6 right. billion, I think. So, is. so just to correct the, the figure, um, member, um, the figure is, is about half of that, 827 million. It's still a significant figure, okay. but just for correction. Um, insofar as what we are doing, um, the first mode of, of, of attack would be to disconnect properties. Um, but even before that, we, we contact customers to encouraging them to make payment. Um, the intent is never to stop the service, but rather to collect the rate. And then we go to disconnection, and there's some other activities. So I'll ask um, my director, customer Kim, Ms. Dumas, what, and she could give, give some more details on it. Debt recovery steps, we have two sets, the encouragement, and then we have enforcement. So for encouragement, we'll use things like telephone reminders, reminder notices, and actual interactions with the customer. And then on the enforcement, we have disconnections. But because the majority of our customer base are not metered, we first would, in, in the majority of cases, have to install curve valves so as to make um, the disconnections uh, easier to do. And then thereafter, once somebody is disconnected for more than three months, then we'll take the legal, legal action steps, which um, would include 
serving the pre-action protocol letters to, to the extent of sale of property. I think the, the first part of your question had to do with why, why would receivables reach to this level. Um, I think in the in majority of cases, if you can't disconnect some, some, someone, that, that is the majority problem. Then you have the instances of the government receivables, which is at the level of, let's say, about $78 million at, at this time. And then you have some other sectors where we have, like, abstraction, so on, which are contributing. Nevertheless, the residential carries the highest receivables and basically um, being able to disconnect those customers easily will, will help WASA to reduce the receivables in the area. Um, Mr. Germany, for, um, can I ask um, the official, what percentage of this $800 million would you categorize as industrial, commercial, residential, governmental, in terms of this 800, and thanks for the correction, Mr. Punta, Mr. Poon King, um, Poon King, yeah. What percentage would you say without, you know, we could probably ask the chairman to give us a listing because we like to help you. Um, so maybe you can give us just a percentage, if you right. can. Uh, yes. I have them in broad terms, but you may have it captured differently, industrial, commercial, governmental, residential, as the case may be, in that kind of category. I, I have the, the data, so I could provide it. Um, in terms of percentages, so business and industrial, 4.4%. What I'll do, I'll probably give the, the, the highest ones, and that, that would be more instructive. Um, residential is 62.9%. Uh, the next highest is public sector at 8.5%. Uh, then uh, water abstraction at 7.0%. And then industrial estate at 6.4%. There are others, but they are at lower level. But Mr. Mr. Poon King, when we talk about residential, we're talking about ordinary residents in TNT, and or you're talking about, for instance, um, where where is the bulk of this coming from? Because I thought you know we had customers from a residential point of view, faithfully honoring their monthly or bi-monthly um, commitments. I I'm shocked to hear that. 62% is residential. Can you help us to clarify where, 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 where are these people? Did this residential in Trinidad and Tobago? Well, yeah. you're across, I don't have, I don't have the, um, the yeah, maybe Mr. Yeah, you can if provide you could that. provide that information yes. in writing to the committee, yes. please, because I'm sure yes. when you're up here in front of the PAC, um, I think it's next week, um, a lot of questions are going to be asked along these lines. Um, I would just like to, um, in terms of um, where we are with the questioning, is to focus on wastewater reuse, right? Mm -hmm. And um, in particularly, in particular, certain aspects in terms of have we um, have we assessed <coughs> or have any any study being done to um, to realistically assess the potential of wastewater re reuse? in terms of ensuring water security. And um, secondly, um, roughly, if you have any figures, if not, you could give it to us in writing. Um, how much uh, wastewater effluent is generated from both uh, WASA plants and the private, private sector plants in, in, in order we get an overall picture of how many, how much effluent is generated from our wastewater treatment plants and the potential or the uh, feasibility of um, the eff with, based on the effluent standards, you know, what potential is there to, to convert 
that uh, waste water effluent into water for reuse for both agricultural as well as industrial and even portable water use. And uh, what is the status regarding the Beetham waste water reuse project and the plans, whatever plans they, they are to get that, uh, the water from that project into the uh, mainstream supply. I know that the Ministry of Public Utilities and their response has referred this committee to NGC because they said as far as they're concerned, they do not really have information but in terms of wasser specifically and that uh, Beetham wastewater reuse project. Right, with respect, um, with respect to the Beetham reuse, and WASA's position is similar to that of the Ministry. Uh, the project was originally an NGC project. Um, so we didn't have direct um, involvement with respect to the management, funding, and so on of the project. Uh, so Could you advise the committee, is the plant operational? Is any water being, is uh, any of the water being, uh, is any of the effluent being used by WASA? No, no. What, what is operational at the Beetham is the WASA's Beetham Wastewater Treatment Plant where water is collected from our wastewater catchment, which spans from West Moorings to Mount Hope. The water comes to the wastewater treatment plant to treat and then discharge. The intent of the Beetham reuse plant was to take the effluent from Wasser's wastewater plant and then further treat that um, to produce industrial quality water for Point Lisa's. So that project didn't happen. So the water from Wasser's wastewater treatment plant currently is discharged into, into the environment. Okay, and your response to what I asked before, Mr. Punke? Um, with respect to, to, to water reuse on, on the whole, um, we are actively looking at the uh, possibility of having uh, the point of pay refinery consider using uh, effluent uh, from the San Fernando wastewater treatment plant, which is currently under construction. Uh, so the intent there would be to pipe the water from the plant, which is under construction, to point of pay to replace the, the water that is currently used um, or to augment the water that is currently used uh, for industrial purpose and the point of pay refineries could then be considered for alternative use including potable water supply. Uh, but that, there are a number of factors, it, it is currently being considered. Okay, and the newly constructed plants or upgraded plants at, um, at Malabar and those plants? When the, good day, Chairman. When the Malaba plant was conceptualized, what we had looked at is in terms of what, in terms of the same, same thing in terms of reuse of the wastewater. The Malaba plant and that catchment actually is just upstream of our Karani intake, which serves the Karani water treatment plant. And, you know, when we looked in terms of the best use of the water, it was really to return the water back to the, the Karani River itself so that it could replenish the base flows in the Karani River. So the intention always was for Malabar to replenish the Karani River so that they can continue supporting the Karani water treatment plant. Okay, uh, just for Mr. Poonking, but in, in the consideration of the, um, the challenges in terms of surface water and uh, the, the impact of it on climatic changes, um, is, is the authority, um, do you all really consider to, to really investigate in, in further detail the, the potential of wastewater reuse as a possible source of water? Yes, well, I, as I indicated, um, you, we, we want to look at a volume of water that is viable. And certainly, as, as Ms. Lee Singh Pereira had indicated, the Malabar was considered, and currently the San Fernando is being considered. The volumes we're looking at there are between 40 and 45,000 cubic meters per day, ultimately. It's around eight to nine million gallons. Uh, the smaller plants, it will be more challenging. 
So we're looking at, um, I said the main focus is that San Fernando plant as to how we could utilize that water. There's the potential for the industrial application or potentially agriculture um, to the east of San Fernando as well. Particularly in terms of agriculture, because I, I, I know we're looking at the large oil flows from the treatment where we have substan substantial quantities of effluent and may think that it might be more feasible for those large quantities. But actually the small to medium sized plants, particularly in localized environments, may prove to be a, a lifesaver uh, in terms of a crisis. Uh, particularly in terms of scarcity, and um, maybe, maybe, I'm just suggesting that maybe um, for localized supply, and particularly to build storage capacities and, um, in, in respective uh, areas, maybe um, it might be worthwhile looking into some of the medium, medium um, size uh, wastewater plants as well. I, I would like to come to the, the whole question of tariffs. I mean, we have been told that our, our tariff for the charges for water consumption is the lowest in the Caribbean. And considering all the cash flow problems that water, WASA has and the amount of subsidies that have to go into WASA uh, to keep it um, operational, I mean, what is the status with application for increase in tariffs? Um, and what are, what are the issues that you are really dealing with that um, you have so much problems in really uh, getting um, uh, a reasonable tariff for the water that is supplied? Okay, so in terms of, of, of tariff, uh, we have, WASA has prepared a business plan and that is currently under final review and it outlines um, the, the WASA's expenditures and, and, and proposals going forward and what type of tariff um, could be considered. Uh, so it is under final review between WASA and the, the ministry um, towards having it finalized going forward. You want to um, advise the committee of a time frame because um, when it, when it would be submitted. What what sort of time is the RIC going to take um, um, but, but, based but, but, on your, your experience, all of these things? Because, I mean, the intention may be there, but maybe a year, two years, three years will pass, and, uh, you know, right, you what, have what, what I want, want to indicate is we are currently, the review that is currently being done is based on the um, proposed intervention of the IDB. We are looking at that. Um, so I think that we want to probably within two to three months to have that revision done and then to um, work with the ministry towards having it um, considered thereafter. So that, that's one part as to how long the actual process will take, that, that I can't say. All right, in case you are wondering, we, we will be stopping at 5 p.m. So we don't intend to keep you all here into the early hours of the night. Not this time, but um, we, we have, some questions that we have gotten from the public, and we have selected two questions that I will be asking before we close off. Uh, but um, be, before we do, um, I, I would like to, to come back to the question of metering. Now, we know as part of the efforts to re reduce uh, consumption and manage, manage consumption, the authority intends to get into a bulk metering program. Um, I know we would probably need some more details of it, but we will, we will request that in writing from you. Uh, and the bulk metering program would, of course, help, help you to assess where your water is being consumed. And also, I understand it would allow you to do some, some degree of pressure management. But um, <clears throat> what are the reasons, really? Um, maybe, maybe funding, but um, in terms of the domestic metering program, because to me, it's a catch-22 situation. You, you get into domestic metering, your, your revenues has the potential to drop significantly because people, it, it's a deterrent to excessive consumption, but that could work against you because 
the less water people consume, of course, your, your revenues are going to drop. And in, in, in such a scenario, the where also your metering itself, if you could indicate to us what percentage have you accomplished with regards to domestic metering, and seeing that you have put metering as one of the main pillars for the control of consumption, reduction of consumption of water, what measures, uh, what proposals does the authority have specifically to really get this domestic metering going? Because it has been around for decades we have been talking about metering. And um, the progress, if you could indicate the progress to us and what proposals you have to, um, to get this program really going. Okay, in terms of the residential metered customers, which is at around 3%, it's 2.97% actually. Um, so it's, it's fairly low. In so far as having the universal metering to, to, to address that, the, there will be a significant capital um, investment to be done. And that again um, is proposed under the IDB intervention for the water sector. Uh, so at that point, um, the program will, will take place where we'll see the, the number or the percentage of, of customer, residential customers who are metered to have that number increase. Could you give a little more details on the I, IDB intervention, as, as, as you put it? Um, is, it is, is it a um, short-term intervention? Is it is it going to be phased over the years to come? What, what, what are the, some of the details, if you can inform us, please? The IDB intervention would be over a number of years, but I'll ask the water sector to, to give you the key highlights of what it will contain. The water sector improvement program, which was developed by the IDB in collaboration with the Ministry of Public Utilities and WASA, um, speaks to, uh, has a specific focus on non-revenue water reduction. And that includes metering, um, because Mr. Poonking said earlier that it's a challenge for WASA to manage or to be able to manage demand without metering, but it's also a challenge for an individual to manage demand without having that signpost of how much water you're actually using. Um, so you could be the most water conscious person in the world, but if you don't know if there's a, a leak in your property, for example, um, because you don't have a meter, there's, there's, there's no way for you to actually um, conserve. So the metering is one of the infrastructure improvements that the, non, that the water sector improvement program is looking at. It's also referring to non-revenue water reduction from the perspective of not just leak repair and pipe replacement, but also pressure management. Um, so what we're seeing is that, and the models have shown in terms of utility management, that you have to establish district metered areas or discrete areas of supply and manage flows and pressure within there and that will enable you to specifically pinpoint leaks in your system, um, both in, in, on your network side as well as on the customer side. So we're saying we need to establish or segregate the country into district metered areas and measure the use and manage use within, manage use and supply within those areas. So those are the infrastructural changes that we're looking for, as well as climate change investments. Um, with the recovered NRW water and metering, we have, we have projected from a financial perspective that this entire program will have a 17% internal rate of return. And what that means is that with recovered NRW, with metering, WASA can see an increase in revenue with a simultaneous decrease in their operating costs because they're now more efficient in terms of their operations. Um, and this program actually pays back for itself. Um, so there's no need to increase the subvention or for the government itself to service the debt, but the savings that WASA will get um, from their improved or the, their more efficient and lean operations, they can actually now pay or service, service this loan. Um, and then the final pillar under the Water Sector Improvement Program is sustaining the results, um, which is 
instituting or establishing a, a performance-based culture um, within WASA to hold them accountable to particular benchmarks as it relates to their operations. So that, that's really the, the focus of, of the entire water sector improvement program. Mr. Chairman, let me just, let me yes, just ask please. one question tied to that. I may not have heard it. You may have indicated this before. In that water sector improvement program, is there funds available for replacement of pipe work? Yeah, so strategic pipe, strategic pipe replacement. Um, would it be possible that the, the committee would, would, would be requesting that um, if there are any, any uh, reports regarding this uh, water in sector, water sector improvement program, particularly the IADB uh, inputs and proposals, if we could uh, be provided copies of those, please. All right, um, we just have um, 14 minutes rem remaining, and I mean, we, we do have some more questions, but I think what the committee will do is review the questions that we have, that we haven't brought up as yet, and we would decide that we would send it to you in writing, and you can respond in writing, or maybe if, if we need to get you all back in for another session, so we'll let you know. But um, there are two questions here. We have some questions, but um, some I prefer not to ask. Um, I've selected two from members of the public who have emailed in, who are watching on. Uh, first one is, can WASA listed measures in place to address the issues of customer service, as there have been complaints of calls being dropped when calls are made about a potential leak? And the second question is, does WASA have its water schedule for all areas on its website? If not, why not? And where can this information be obtained? Okay, first, um, with respect to the, the customer service part and the interaction with WASA, we do have our call center, which is the primary mode of communication with customers, um, but for customers to communicate with WASA on service issues. We have increased the, the complement of staff within the call center by approximately 25%, 25%, Sherry, 25%, 25%. And uh, so we have been receiving um, or accepting more calls. Uh, the Prior to, to getting the staff on, we would have uh, uh, an acceptance rate of between um, 40 and 40 to 50 and 55, 55%. Uh, last month we had an acceptance rate of 80%. Um, what we will also have available is we have the WASA services app where you can have the app put on your, your smartphone and you can make some requests. We still want to improve or increase the functionality of the app. Currently, you can pay your bill, you can report a leak, or you can request truck bond. Uh, we are looking, as I say, to make it more functional so that um, it, it, it would provide for, for other services. And we also have uh, um, where people can communicate via Facebook, via Twitter, via email. Uh, so that we do have other modes of, 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 of communication that, that people can, can utilize. Uh, the second question was, if you could just repeat the second question. Right, so the schedules. Yes, the schedules are on the website and we um, we will be updating them based on uh, any changes that would uh, occur uh, where they need to be amended based on water availability. So that will be an ongoing process where we will, we will have them updated going forward. In terms of your, the customer um, service, um, the calls and all of those things, do you all have an, uh, an assessment system in place to, to assess how effective your that that faces your your customer uh, yes we piece. do we, we can we can we do record the, the number of calls we get in the number we, we we accept and and respond to and so on we do have that information and the authority is satisfied that you have a fairly acceptable um, level of performance with regards to that um, well we we i think based on where we were we acknowledge that that we had some some 
groundwork to, ground to do, so we did increase the, the staff. Um, our target is 90 percent. Uh, we, we currently at 80 percent, so we still have a little work to do towards getting where we want to be. So, um, we'd have to start wrapping up, um, but before I, I invite comments from closing, brief closing remarks from either, uh, both entities, um, just briefly, if you can um, indicate to the committee uh, the role of the Salcott in terms of water security. Um, they produce a fair amount of water that is purchased by WASA, and in the context of security, uh, medium and long term, uh, your contractual arrangements with the Salcott, um, how, how, how do you see that? I mean, where, where specifically is the authority with regards to that in terms of water security? Okay, WASA, um, we currently have available for distribution, uh, depending on, on the time of year, between 220 and 240 million gallons of water. The Salcott produces and delivers to us 40 million gallons a day. Uh, so they are fairly significant. So it's around 16 16 percent of our total distribution. Uh, in terms of the contract, um, I believe the contract is in force until 2036, 29. So it's 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 a fairly um, it was renegotiated and, and renewed. So we do have that contract in place for some time um, going forward, and it will be for the delivery of 40 million gallons of water a day um, until the expiration of of the um, contract. So in terms of water security, um, based on the source being seawater, um, it wouldn't be subject to um, all the issues associated with, with, with rainfall. There's one issue um, that does, it does come up on an annual basis, where during the dry season, where you have less runoff from local rivers and from South America, the salinity in the Gulf of Paria goes up making uh, the treatment process a little more difficult um, to, to achieve the, the, the 40 million gallons of water a day. Um, but they are, at this time, a, a significant component of our water supply infrastructure. Okay, uh, just for a few seconds, um, through the chair, um, Mr. Poon King, um, what is the value to the taxpayers of this um, 40 million gallons um, per day. And does WASA owe or has any outstanding bills to this particular supplier? Well, first, I don't know if, if, you, if you could clarify when you say the first part of your question. No, in, in other words, what do we pay as a, as a nation state, through WASA, okay. to this supplier, okay. on a, you know, in terms of the supply of water. I, okay. Uh, the bill, the bill, the monthly bill to the Salcott is approximately six million U.S. dollars um, for the delivery of water. And uh, at present, um, we did have some outstanding bills with the Salcott, and we have made arrangements to have those, those paid off. Certainly. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, let ask um, uh, Ms. Duke, our permanent secretary, to um, a brief closing remarks, and afterwards, uh, Mr. Poon King, any brief closing remarks, if any, uh, before we wrap up? Chairman, members, uh, the Ministry of Public Utilities, thanks you for the opportunity to share today. We have certainly taken note of some of your observations, and as we move forward, we will incorporate in our policies and plans. Thank you. Well, similarly, from WASA, I would like to thank the committee on behalf of the WASA team. Um, and I look forward to, um, well, you said further questions would be coming, but even beyond the question, to have the support um, that when the responses are provided, that we get the support to have in the, those, those um, recommendations implemented towards improving the water and wastewater services that we provide. Thank you. Yes, I, I definitely the support will be there because uh, the mandate of the committee is really in terms of um, 
this particular inquiry um, with all the concerns, uh, the, the, the current situation with WASA and all the, all the agencies involved with water security is to, to see if we can distill from all of it all, you know, a clear, a, a, a clear direction, a clear pathway and whatever recommendations that this uh, committee could come up with to augment the tremendous work that is being done, done um, because the committee gathers that our intent is good. I mean, we're really working for the welfare of the nation and ensuring water security. And whatever recommendations we can come up with that would support and, and consolidate all, all of the efforts that are being made, we, we would certainly do so. So I would like to thank all, all, all everyone who came from the respective um, agencies and to, to thank um, all committee members for their participation, uh, to thank the, our viewing and listening audience, um, particularly for their inputs, and to thank the, the staff of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Julian Ogilvy, who is standing in for Ms. Angelique Masaya, Secretary, and then all other support staff um, and broadcast staff of Parliament for their input. Thank you very much. This meeting is adjourned. adjourned.